Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, today's research um, seminar of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Rob Raven, um, and I will just do a very brief words of opening before I hand over to uh, today's chair, which is uh, Marco Lecce. So first, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from where I'm speaking, uh, the Bunurung people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respect uh, to the elders past and present. And um, yeah, it's really great that um, I don't have to do too much work today. Um, so Marco, uh, who is a, a regular, who joins us regularly in these seminars, is actually based at uh, uh, the Business and Economics Department. And Monash approached me and um, uh, said, I've got a great speaker that I would like to um, have in this seminar series. And um, I agree. Um, so we have a great speaker today. And so it's also, uh, I think, a great example of something that we hope to accomplish with this seminar series, that it really is a, a platform for having interdisciplinary conversations around some of the grand challenges uh, that we are facing. Um, so it's really great to be able to open that up also to um, uh, people coming from the wider management environment to uh, host speakers. So with that, I'm happy to hand over to Marco uh, for chairing today's uh, seminar. Thanks, Rob. Um, and thanks, Alessio. Uh, I had the luck to meet Alessio in Prato, actually. He came to give a guest talk um, to one of my units that I'm teaching in Prato, a European economy. Um, and he's an economist. I'll, I'll give the brief introduction. He's an economist at the uh, Director General for Economic and Financial Affairs. The, is the commission department uh, responsible for the European Union policy promoting economic growth. Uh, he's also a junk professor at Science Po uh, and HEC Paris, and he's the author of The Group for Good, published by Harvard University Press. I still can see the book there. I had the pleasure to interview him also for my podcast for my students on economic growth, and I highly also recommend the book. Uh, it's a very fresh take on economic growth and sustainability. Um, he will present today his new um, research, Green Industrial Policies and Necessary Evil to Avoid a Climate uh, Catastrophe. So Alessio, uh, we have roughly, if we can keep five, 10 minutes for the Q&A at the end, uh, you know, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see if I can share my slides. You tell me if you can see them all right. Are they fine? Yeah. yeah, very good. All right. Thanks a lot for the for the invitation, for the introduction, uh, Rob and uh, and Marco. <laughs> the fact that uh, me and Marco are running it makes me feel uh, a bit like I'm in Italy. It's an Italian uh, seminar. Um, but yeah, as we were saying, I'm based uh, I'm based in Brussels now, uh, and uh, I'm gonna talk to you about when when Mark approached me. Uh, we were talking, of course. My my overall uh, field of expertise and interest is the intersection of the economy, economic growth, and climate change, and so basically, how to reconcile the two, uh, or more broadly, how to reconcile the economy and nature, say, loosely speaking. But today I'm going to zoom in uh, into one uh, specific uh, aspect uh, of this uh, very broad uh, topic that I've tried to cover in a book, but even one book is not sufficient to, uh, to touch on, on all the topics. And I will look at this, uh, um, this idea of green industrial policy or industrial policy in the service of the green transition. And uh, uh, specifically, it builds on um, on another book and or a book chapter that came out a few months ago with uh, Bruegel, which is an economic uh, think tank here in Brussels. And what they were trying to do, what uh, Simone and Reynil, they were trying to do, the editors, was to bring contributions from various sides, also from uh, the US and, and other places, from various scholars, to try and, and let's say, um, offer some uh, ideas as to how to use industrial policy in a smart way, because as we, as we will see very soon, uh, there's a lot of talking uh, in policy circles of how we have to use industrial policy and so on, but it is not 
entirely clear, uh, my impression is how to do that in a smart way or in a way that uh, works. And so that's where this uh, policy handbook uh, uh, comes uh, from. And in that book, I specifically, uh, the, the, the talk of today is uh, the book chapter, but in a way that it, I will touch upon also another article, uh, journal article that came out again a few months ago that I wrote with a few colleagues, co-authors, um, again, on industrial policy. In that case, uh, not only green industrial policy, but broadly speaking, industrial policy uh, and how to do it in a good way, in a smart way. So uh, first things first, a bit of, uh, of definitions, uh, because my impression, again, is that there's a lot of talking about industrial policy, but different people mean different things. And uh, I suspect that this is the product of the fact that um, industrial policy touches upon so many things. It goes from trade policy to innovation, to foreign direct investment. And so because it is so broad, uh, people approach it from different angles. And then we end up uh, using the same term, but not speaking the same things. And so to have a, a compact definition so that you know what I'm talking about in this, uh, in this, uh, in this seminar, I'm working with this, uh, with this definition, which is to say industrial policy is any type of uh, intervention, policy intervention uh, that tries to change the structure of production uh, towards a certain direction, so towards a certain sector, uh, which offers better prospects uh, or prospects of reward. So there are two fundamental components uh, in this definition. The first is you shift production to a certain in a certain direction. And the second is that there are certain sectors that are better, more favorable than others. So you, you, these are the two fundamental elements, which is what I was uh, detailing in this uh, slide. Uh, so production is more desirable than others uh, in some, some sectors than others. And because of this, you can use government policies to make that happen more. Okay. Um, now, just one word on whether this is the case, because for a long time, this was not seen as the case, although there were some, uh, there is some work, uh, there are some scholars that have been arguing that indeed there are certain sectors that are better than others. This is one of those cases where, let's say, it feels like there was a great disconnect between uh, economists and the rest. So if I were to ask my mother, is production, which is not an economist, she works in something completely different. But if you, if she thinks that production is better in, in some sector, some sectors are better than others, I'm sure she would say, yes, of course, it's evident. Uh, but uh, instead, for, for a long time, for mo most economists would have disagreed in the sense that they would say production is production, you, you focus on what you're good at, and that's it. Um, but some uh, scholarly work throughout the years has questioned this. There is a famous paper, for example, by Hausmann uh, Roderick uh, and others from 2007. And what they try to argue is indeed um, production is better in certain sectors than others, or rather what you export matters because certain exports are related to um, higher productivity levels uh, and especially they uh, precede larger growth accelerations. And so that not every sector is the same and it not, it's not the same to export anything, whether you export agricultural produce or high tech uh, chips uh, does make a difference and they can show it empirically in uh, let's say exposed uh, looking at what growth prospects are. Um, it, so this is one type of literature. There is more of a, say, management or McKinsey Global Institute type of uh, analysis, 
and you have you know you have these reports that say i don't know the the future is ai the future is uh, biotech the future is automation or what not and they try to give you projections of how great growth is going to be in certain sectors so effectively in the back of their minds they are making this bet that growth in certain sectors is going to be stronger and therefore to a certain extent uh, you want to be latched on to those uh, to producing those things because you know or you can expect that the growth will be uh, strong uh, the converse of the or the other side of this is we there's a, people who do it with jobs so you can say you know automation will uh, cancel out a lot of call center jobs and so if you look at the world this way uh, if you are specialized in call centers that ain't great and if instead you're specialized in manufacturing robots that is good and so again this sort of provides ammo for uh, the definition of of industrial policy we've used and, and uh, the desire to use it um, and then more recently uh, there is a third consideration which is uh, less economic and more uh, political or related to national security and foreign policy, which is to say leadership in certain sectors, certain sectors are particularly, or particularly, or so-called dual technologies. And so it means that they are civilian sectors, but they have implications for, for the military as well. And so that if you have a strong, uh, a strong, uh, command of AI, of uh, 5G, of quantum computing and whatnot, okay, these things are good for production, but they also have military implications. And so to a certain extent, you want to have leadership in those sectors or produce things yourself in those sectors because it is related to your military capacity. And so these are some of the arguments that would be used to argue to, to claim that indeed production in certain sectors is better. Now, I was telling you that for a long time, economists would have disagreed. And the reason they would have disagreed is, um, is that to a certain extent, uh, or let me say first, first one thing. Uh, so economists would have disagreed. So had we had this conversation uh, five years ago, um, most Marco would have already stopped me probably by now telling me, what are you talking about? Industrial policy is bad. We have plenty of evidence that shows that this is bad and, and so on. Um, it is worth mentioning briefly, and it is the topic of the second paper I, I showed you at the beginning, that all countries always effectively have engaged in some form of industrial policy. Whether it is the US, whether it is China, even though they have completely different uh, economic models, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, France, Germany, the UK. So even countries that would have claimed uh, that they weren't doing industrial policy and industrial policy was bad, were doing some of it. it, it of course, the extent matters. So some were doing little and others were using it uh, uh, to a strong degree, but all countries engage uh, in it. And as a matter of fact, the joke goes uh, that uh, the, the most successful industrial policy in the US has been to persuade others that the US doesn't do industrial policy to a certain extent. Um, but uh, it is a fact that we are going through a resurgence in the use of this tool. And uh, you can, uh, there, I'm taking this from a, from a recent paper that came out like a month ago by uh, Reka Juhash, uh, Lane and Roderick, and, and they show a time trend and you can see that, it is, that industrial policy is increasing in its use. And, uh, and the, the other way of looking at it is uh, from uh, this, uh, this chart, which I mean, comes from the Financial Times, but it is built on IMF data, and they look at the presence of um, 
terms like reshoring, uh, nearshoring, and so on in uh, uh, com company reports. And again, you see that the concerns of this sort, and so that you have to bring production of certain things closer to home, and, and so that place of production matters, is uh, is uh, is coming back and and for, for forcefully so. Um, but uh, I was telling you for a long time, economists were against this uh, this idea, and the reason they would have brought was the following, which is look just focus on whatever you're good at a bit along the lines of you know david ricardo type of thinking so from 300 plus years ago they would have said you produce if you're good at producing apples you make apples and and you will sell those and you will sell those and buy uh, ai products and that is fine you you specialize in what you're good at and and it's okay um, and to a certain extent, if this means that manufacturing shifts from the US to China or from Europe to China, from Japan to China, it just means that you don't have a comparative advantage in manufacturing. It means you have comparative advantage in something else. Maybe it's services, maybe it is... Uh, digital or finance or whatnot and so let uh, china make products and you will focus on banking and you trade and you have gains uh, the, the famous gains from uh, from specialization and, and trade and of course in order to do that you need to preserve a rule-based open trade world order and so the, for for this type of reasoning to work you need uh, some set of standardized rules uh, where also the others agree that they are not going to uh, use a forceful industrial policy. And so we all uh, sort of let comparative advantages materialize and we try to remove barriers to trade so that you can specialize in financial services. I specialize in manufacturing. We trade and we experience all these uh, benefits. So this was, let's say, the consensus among the mainstream or the majority of mainstream economists for a very long time. Um, this consensus has broken down. And uh, I, was, uh, I was mentioning industrial policy was for, for a long time, it was considered as, uh, as a bad word. And the, econ the, the IMF uh, or two authors at the IMF were sort of joking about this thing because industrial policy was the policy that shall not be named, and so it was uh, it was seen as uh, as anathema for for a long time, and now we are experiencing the return of the policy that shall not be named, which is the title of this paper from twenty nineteen, and uh, and there are many reasons for that, and so I'm I'm listing a few here. The first is that of course what I was telling you before is that th that type of argument works if you have a level playing field at global level and we've agreed that broadly speaking okay everybody sort of does a little bit of industrial policy but it's very little and contained uh, and limited to 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 a small extent but of course you had the example of china which is not a small country which entered the wto and for a long time, the presumption was, okay, it's true, they're using uh, strongly industrial policy and, and government tools to push, let's say, for manufacturing strength and in certain sectors in particular and so on. But it's fine because eventually they will converge to our model. And so progressively, as they develop, they will slow down uh, their use of, of, of industrial policy, which obviously we have not seen. And so, uh, so there's that, and there is the fact that, of course, um, China China's growth has been uh, incredible by global standards, by historical standards, and so many people are starting to say, uh, you know, maybe we got it wrong. Maybe it should be the other way around, and you should use industrial policy in order to foster economic growth. Um, and, and the counter-argument is sort of losing steam, given the success that China has been 
in reaching this goal. The second fundamental shock has been COVID because COVID-19 uh, was a time when you realized that you needed uh, certain things, production of certain things, and that governments in many countries used their powers. Uh, in the US, they even uh, had to uh, resort to the Defense Act, I think it was called, where the president can effectively force companies to produce certain things. So this is like the strongest extent of, uh, of pushing production in, uh, in a certain direction. Uh, because you needed certain things, whether it was uh, face masks, whether it was uh, yeah, personal protective equipment more broadly. At some point, it was vaccines and ramping up vaccine production uh, with uh, warp speed, I think it was called uh, uh, the operation in the US to, to scale up uh, vaccine production. And so we have seen a lot of use of uh, these tools uh, to foster production in this and that during covid and so again this uh, this mantra that you cannot do it uh, has sort of fallen uh, under the weight of the of the pandemic period and so by now it uh, it has uh, sort of been normalized another aspect related to covid is that when covid hit um global supply chains for a brief period of time were interrupted and uh, when uh, that happened, it was sort of a realization, um, a late realization of how crucial digital technologies have become. Meaning that if you cannot get access to chips and chip production, effectively these things have become so omnipresent that whatever you do cannot uh, go on if you don't have access to chips. And the classic example for Europe that is uh, is strong in up until now at least in car production was the realization that of how much of the value added of a car by now relies on technology um, on digital technology and chips. And so how production for BMW, for Volkswagen and so on had to come to slow down uh, because they couldn't access uh, chips. Uh, and this applies to a variety of other sectors, meaning that certain uh, you need to have access to certain uh, products like chips, or else uh, whatever you specialized in doesn't work anymore. The fourth point is a return of geopolitics, which is potentially related to the third point, which is to say that uh, dependencies can be weaponized. And so that if I produce chips, for example, uh, given we were making that, uh, we were looking at that, um, and your whole economy, whatever you do, is dependent on it, I can cut you off. And in the short term, you're going to suffer the pain of that. And so again, this sort of me, the fact that uh, you can weaponize dependencies on certain products kind of breaks down the whole principle that we specialize, whatever we specialize in doesn't matter um, because you can do without apples, which is what I specialize in, but I cannot do without chips because it sort of brings my whole economy to a grinding halt. And so again, what you export matters. And so it strengthens that argument that uh, certain uh, uh, sectors are, are more important than others. And the final point is climate change. And uh, this is a bit what I will focus on from, from here onwards, because we are looking at green uh, industrial policy. And so just one word on, on, the, green, uh, on the green transition, which I, I would assume you all things that you already know. So this idea that we have to rapidly transform the economy in order to reach the climate goals we've set for ourselves in uh, the Paris Agreement and or net zero let's say by 2050 more specifically and in that uh, the argument has been made uh, by Renil Del Vogelers who are the same authors of the book I was mentioning but in another product uh, they were showing how industrial policy how green industrial policy can help and uh, one of the reasons 
um, is that they can twist or help the private sector to shift production towards uh, uh, green products. And that if you leave it to market forces, there is some sort of path dependency in the way you do innovation. So you will continue doing innovation in, in, in the stuff that you are already doing. And if it is internal combustion engine cars, you will continue down that path, but it will be hard to completely switch to a new technology, say electric vehicles and car batteries. And so industrial policies can help to try and get out or break out of this uh, path dependency. And so that is one of the arguments that is being made, uh, but there's plenty more. And typically they, they go around ideas of market failure so that you're trying to fix some market failures by using industrial policy. Um, and one of them is this idea of, uh, um, to a certain extent, excessive risk aversion in, uh, in the private sector, often related to lack of uh, perfect information. So our models uh, typically work with, with perfect information, but the fact that the private sector is uncertain about which technology will prevail, um, let's say for the green transition, leads to a wait and see mode. And so you are at the risk that the, the private sector would underinvest in certain technologies waiting for others to do it. Uh, and this leads to a negative uh, underinvestment equilibrium. And so you can use industrial policy to push uh, as a government uh, in favor of certain key technologies. The second really, and is related, uh, is the idea that we know that many of these uh, green technologies that we will need are far from uh, a point of being marketed. And so if it is green aviation, let's say, we know that uh, it will be very hard to see uh, planes uh, using uh, hydro green hydrogen or uh, electric batteries uh, for, uh, let's say, 10 years, next 10 years at least. And so, uh, again, the risk is that because some of these technologies are far from marketable, um, the private sector is at risk of underinvesting in the sense that it's hard, the, the, the planning horizon is relatively short, or there is a strong discount factor, and the risk is that there is underinvestment. And so again, uh, industrial policy can help in that. And then there is a political economy um, element, which I think is important, which is for a long time, economists would just argue, you know, you need to introduce carbon pricing because if you introduce carbon pricing, you set incentives straight and uh, then firms have, uh, yeah, have a strong incentive to invest in green technologies and so on, which is all true. But the problem is that from a political perspective, it could very well be that carbon prices are not feasible. And this is something, for example, that we're seeing in the United States, which is, uh, has been trying to introduce carbon prices uh, at the federal level for now, some 20, a bit less than 20 years, and has always failed. Um, uh, or alternatively, as it is the case in Europe, we have carbon pricing. So we have the, the longest, uh, longest standing uh, uh, emission trading scheme uh, in the world, to my knowledge. So more than or around 20 years. But uh, of course, it's not only a matter of having uh, a carbon price, but the level. and uh, it is very possible that for us to reach the level that we need uh, is politically unfeasible. And so if you factor in politics um, and you cannot achieve uh, the green transition through carbon pricing or carbon pricing only, industrial policy can complement it. And to a certain extent, uh, this is what uh, the Biden administration is doing or betting on. So they are saying, look, we've banged our head against this idea of carbon pricing for 20 years. It does not work. Let's try going down another route. And so we do a lot of industrial policy through the Inflation Reduction Act, and we invest in green technologies. And so we're going to do the green transition in this way, rather than uh, with carbon pricing. Um, 
And, uh, and there are papers, uh, and I'm mentioning this by Asimoglu and others, that show that the two co can go hand in hand. And actually that if you do it uh, in a, a well, you can uh, achieve a better, a faster transition by combining industrial policy with carbon pricing. So it's not necessarily that the two are at odds. You can do both and it can even be an optimal uh, strategy. There is then uh, um, a competitive argument. So again, we are, we're moving uh, closer to an integrate to geoeconomics or to an integration of economic considerations with uh, geopolitical considerations. And that is to say that there is one way of framing the green transition, which is something I've been doing as well, or along the lines of something that will resemble an industrial revolution in the fact that we have to reinvent the whole of production and, and consumption because we're trying to reach this net, net zero targets. Um, and effectively, if you like with past industrial revolutions, it is uh, of crucial importance uh, to try and pioneer certain key technologies. And uh, if you establish yourself uh, as, a, as a, an, a first starter, an early move, mover, and you lock in uh, an advantage in some of the technologies that will become central to the new green economy, you are set to experience huge economic rewards, uh, often reverberating through path dependency for decades. And so if you look at it this way, then uh, because we are at this shifting point in, in the economic structure, it is uh, you have a very strong competitive interest in trying to use all the policy tools you have, uh, trade, investment, uh, and so on, to try and make sure that uh, your firms uh, or firms located within your nation are the ones that uh, end up being, uh, you know, the leaders in solar panels or the leaders in uh, battery storage, because then you, you know that effectively these technologies will become central to, uh, to the green economy. And if you generate scale uh, that is large enough and exp expertise that is strong enough, uh, it could very well be that you're shutting out the others and so that you become the, the powerhouse of uh, the new green economy. Um, now, this argument I've just made, so the competitive argument in favor of industrial policy, in an ideal world, uh, would not exist. So when we model how to do the green transition at the global level, and we have the benevolent dictator, uh, as we do in economics, <laughs> Uh, to look at the optimal equilibrium, you wouldn't uh, necessarily make this argument and or you wouldn't necessarily care because all the spillovers, negative, positive, and so on, would be factored in. Um, and this is another way of saying that if geopolitics weren't a factor uh, and we were to do the green transition through a world government, then this competitive argument wouldn't hold. But the problem is that as... Uh, as economists also like to say, uh, we live in a second best world at best. And so we will have to deal with uh, a green transition that happens in the environment we're in. And uh, as uh, unfortunate as this might be from an optimality point of view, we are not converging towards an, uh, let's say a world government situation. And even on a smaller scale, let's say the Paris Agreement remains uh, built on voluntary uh, national contributions uh, in, in terms of green uh, transition strategies, and we're not moving away from that. So we're not about to create a ministry, ministry for the future, as the book, uh, uh, famous book was titled uh, from a year ago. Uh, and we will have to deal with the fact that ultimately most climate policies will be decided at national level. And, uh, and so they can be loosely coordinated through COP agreements and so on, but they will be national. And so we have to acknowledge that uh, uh, green industrial policy uh, will be there. 
and it is uh, it, it is suboptimal, but, but to a certain extent, it is necessary within the framework we're operating. So all of this to say, green industrial policy is good because it can accelerate the green transition, especially in the environmental arena. Okay, so this is the premise, but this is where the premise stops or my argument in favor of green industrial policy stops because my impression, and, and I like this quote of Larry Summers from a few months back, is that we are experiencing too much excitement to a certain extent with respect to this, uh, to this policy tools, which ultimately, um, you know, or should be seen as a, a necessary evil, but not as something to be glorified or a, or a happy development. The fact that we are uh, using more and more of this uh, of this tool, and I will make uh, I will explain to you why uh, in a second. And, and yes, Larry Summers was was mentioning it along the lines of uh, of generals and wanting generals that if they have to, they go to war, but it's not that they like war. And in the same way, you would want people who do industrial policy to do it as the lesser evil, not to be super excited about uh, about this new policy tool. And, and instead, the way I'm framing it, and the title of this session uh, hints at it, is that we are making a pact with the devil, or, or a Faustian bargain, in, uh, in engaging in uh, industrial policy, which again, I underline, is something that will help achieve a faster green transition in the environment we're in, uh, but uh, will come with significant downsides. And I think that the Perhaps the most fundamental point of departure, or why I see the world uh, this way, is that normally, even economists that are in favor of industrial policy, and now there is a growing uh, uh, cohort of the of mainstream economists that say, okay, you know, actually, in the current environment, it's true we need it. So it went from the policy that shall not be named to, yeah, we actually need it, even those would say there is industrial policy and industrial policy. And specifically, uh, the literature divides industrial policy tools in two categories. One is called offensive and one is called defensive. Offensive um, industrial policy relates to things like giving uh, tax credits or subsidies to companies that scale up solar panels, let's say, or uh, R&D subsidies to pioneer new ways of doing carbon capture and storage, things like this. Um, and economists typically like that. So those that are in favor of green industrial policy, they would say, you know, this is good stuff. You're giving money to innovation, to science, the, uh, to R&D. And so that is good. Then there is the defensive side. And the def defensive side is instead typically building restrictions to uh, trade and investment. And so saying, uh, you know, we don't want uh, Chinese electric vehicles, I'm gonna fence my economy off with uh, tariffs and non-tariff barriers so that I protect my own industry. Uh, things like this, or, or FDI, I, I, I think that, I don't know, Moderna is a crucial company for the United States and therefore I forbid other nations uh, uh, companies from taking it over because I want that technology and know how to stay in the United States. I'm making this up but to give you a, a flavor. And so normally economists uh, look at this division and they say the first part is good, the offensive part is good, and the defensive part is bad. And so we should focus on the good part and do industrial policy only on the offensive side. And the second, the defensive side is protectionism and protectionism is bad. And this is something that, for example, my friends at Bruegel the think tank we're saying. Um, and I was telling you that this is where we depart because I look at it from a political economy perspective. And my argument is the following, which is if you do small potato industrial policy, you can do that. So when uh, 10 years ago, the US was doing industrial policy, but just you know doing a bit of uh, uh, research and innovation uh, using uh, government institutions like DARPA 
or RP, RPAE, which is the DARPA for energy or things like this. You're doing it on a small scale. It doesn't matter. You're using industrial policy, but nobody cares, let's say, uh, at, at a macro level and at a global level. When you start doing it uh, in the realm of hundreds of billions, which is what we're talking about when we're looking, for example, at the inflation tax, the offensive side lays the seed of the defensive side. Because from a political economy perspective, you can imagine that Joe Biden going to Congress and saying, I want, uh, I'm appropriating hundreds of billions because I want to invest in green technologies. Um, and if it happens that I'm giving this money to Chinese companies that are investing in the green transition or European companies are investing in the green transition, it's fine. Chances are that Congress is going to be like, no, look, this money has to stay here. And we wanted to create jobs here and to create know-how here and so on. And so to a certain extent, um, it was to be expected that uh, when, you, when you increase the scale, um, politics intrudes and, uh, and it, it sort of uh, forces the, the two sides to go hand in hand. And indeed, we are seeing, again, this comes from the IMF or financial times through the IMF, um, we're seeing an, a, a greater and greater use of uh, the defensive side of industrial policy across the world. Now, what is interesting is that uh, some people are welcoming this. Because what they say is, you know, yes, as a result of industrial policy, um, we are generating a subsidy race. But while normally a subsidy race is bad because it's wasteful spending and so on from a narrow economic perspective, for the green transition, that is good. And so if we are splurging money across the world and everybody is chasing the same, I don't know, battery production, that's good. It means that billions are flowing into battery technologies, and it means we, the world as a whole will become faster and better at making these things, and we need a lot of these things to reach our climate goals, and so it's good. Um, and so this is one Martin uh, Sandbu specifically on the Financial Times. The other Martin, Wolf, on the Financial Times is instead uh, taking the more standard pro economic approach, and so saying, look, of course, again, compared to an optimal global solution, a global government solution, let's say, or benevolent dictator uh, optimality condition, this is bad because we're, you know, every country is chasing the same technology. And so instead of, of saying the US uh, has a strength in uh, carbon capture and storage, so they do that. And uh, uh, Australia has strength in uh, green mining, uh, and so they do that, or producing hydrogen, green hydrogen, and they do that. And the Chinese are good at making solar panels, and they do that. And we trade. We are all chasing the same things, and so we're we're wasting money, and it is not an optimal. The thing we have to realize is that not everyone can engage in this level in this uh, subsidy war, and effectively. This is because industrial policy is expensive, is, is a very expensive tool because it requires billions and billions to shift production in a certain direction through tax credits, subsidies, and so on. And only certain countries have the financial market access or fiscal uh, strength uh, to engage in it. And, uh, and so the, the great green subsidy wars will not be fought by all countries at the same time in the same way, but only by those that can afford it. And uh, let's say in, in, the, in the chapter, in the book chapter, uh, I, I, I use a shorthand estimation, let's say, of which countries are capable of engaging in it, which is probably to some degree the G20, give you a, an extent, so countries that are members of the G20, um, so not only the West, but also China, India, uh, Brazil, um, 
probably with the ex Argentina not and South Africa not, given the, the difficult fiscal financial situation they are going through. Um, so some countries will manage, and it, again, it is not only in the global north, uh, but it is a subset, a relatively small subset of countries, uh, because the others will not have uh, the financial uh, uh, capacity to engage in it. And so what they will do is the only thing they can do, which is the defensive side of it, uh, in order to try and protect uh, whatever they have in terms of, uh, of, uh, of industrial capacity in some of these fields, along the lines of an infant industry protection. So they will raise the trade and uh, uh, trade barriers, uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers, to try and protect what they have. Um, and this will mostly be in, uh, let's say, the rest. And so mostly uh, developing uh, uh, economies. And this is bad for developing economies because uh, by definition, these countries are not at the technological frontier. So they would benefit or they need technological transfer uh, or transfer of technology and know-how. And that typically happens through FDI, through investment that comes into the country and then ideally generates an ecosystem and it spreads knowledge. Uh, but if you raise uh, trade uh, barriers uh, and investment barriers, uh, you are cutting yourself out from that. And so you will hardly benefit, let's say, or it will be very hard for a uh, developing country to generate uh, on its own uh, a lot of these industries, whether it is microchips, whether it is uh, AI technologies, whether it is green technologies, uh, hydrogen production, electrolysis, uh, uh, carbon capture and storage, and so on. Uh, and so, in a way, you are forced to do that. Uh, and I'm framing it a bit as a prisoner's dilemma. Marco told me there are some economists in the room and some non-economists in the room. For those that are economists, uh, it has the contours of a prisoner's dilemma in the sense that uh, because there is defection on one side, you are forced to defect, but you end up in a negative equilibrium. So this is not. Uh, it is a it is a optimal strategy, but it is it doesn't lead to the optimal equilibrium. Uh, but you are sort of pushed into this. Uh, if you're not economist, forget about the last ten seconds of what I said. Um, and I I mean yeah, reinforcing what I was uh, saying, I, I I feel I don't know what the state of the conversation has been in Australia, and you can tell me. But my impression is that when the U.S did the Inflation Reduction Act or the CHIPS Act, so these large industrial policy uh, initiatives, uh, you know, the press in Europe, but also in other countries, in Korea, in Japan, sort of freaked out, uh, saying, and, and yeah, firms and policymakers uh, saying, ah, this is going to suck all of our production and companies, and they will all move or relocate to the US, attracted by subsidies. And, what I'm trying to say here is, look, probably in equilibrium, not so much, because uh, the EU will devise its own uh, reaction to it, which we're seeing, for example, with the Net Zero Industrial Act, and we have our own uh, CHIPS Act. So we are using subsidies to a large extent. Uh, Korea is doing the same, Japan is doing the same, the UK is doing the same. And so, you know, in equilibrium, you have this green subsidy race, uh, meaning that, okay, some production will shift to the US, but I suspect not uh, all uh, green firms will move there. Uh, but there are some firms that will move production there, uh, and it will be those that have plants in the countries that cannot engage in this, uh, this game. And so probably it will suck production out of uh, emerging markets more than uh, Europe, South Korea, Japan, Australia. Um, and more broadly, once you have barriers or you're introducing the trade barriers or FDI barriers and so on, what you will do as a firm is to try and locate production close to where demand is. And what I show in this chart is where demand is. And demand, uh, as a share of, of global demand, is, uh, is highly skewed because income levels are highly skewed across countries. And so it means that OECD members, so high-income countries, command something like 60% of world demand. 
even if you narrow it, if you look only at the G7, it's uh, it's more than 40%, 45%. If you factor in China, so in one country, it goes to over 60%. So all this to say that with few countries, uh, few countries absorb most of the demand. Uh, and so chances are that production will locate where demand is. So in, in richer countries uh, rather than uh, the rest. The fact that trade is closing down as, um, as a window is a problem uh, for emerging markets. And, uh, um, and the, what I'm referring to here is a, is a report by the World Bank from a few years back that was showing that indeed without fast trade, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't develop fast. So the window of opportunity for, uh, for fast development requires uh, open trade and if, if trade is no longer open you're sort of shutting down that channel um and this i uh, here I explain why but i'm gonna go a bit faster as we uh, approach the end of it um and this uh, overlaps with a moment where historically global income convergence is already sh slowing down and the world bank was already saying look uh, global income income convergence has already stopped and effectively, the, the, green, the use of green industrial policy or industrial policies in general is going to compound this problem. And so th this is why I talk about it as a uh, Faustian pact, as something that was needed, but that will come with downsides. Um, now, of course, it will come with negative consequences. Uh, the, uh, another type of negative consequences is that it will increase prices. It will increase prices also at home. So for the nations that engage in green industrial policy, uh, it would be much cheaper to just buy Chinese solar panels that are cheap rather than uh, having to reinvent the industry at home and build it at home. And initially, this stuff will be more expensive. And so more broadly, uh, you are generating losses and you're making the green transition more expensive um, through uh, industrial policy. The fundamental question is that you will have this force on the one side, so prices are going up, and you will try to contrast it by using innovation and scale. So we know that as you, as the US, I don't know, builds more and more electric vehicle uh, plants or uh, electric battery plants, scale will increase and production costs will go down. But the fundamental question is, uh, so you have these forces sort of contrasting. And so the question is, what does the massive use of industrial policy, offensive and defensive, do to innovation? And I think this is the most crucial question of all. Um, and it could go both ways. Because on the one side, you are, uh, I, I told you, you're, you're sort of shutting down uh, relations with some countries, some that have knowledge, know-how. Or scientific uh, have made scientific advancements in certain technologies, so you're shutting that out. So that is bad for for innovation. On the other side, you could make that the claim or the argument that national security pushes, or what has fostered innovation in many instances. Um, and so this is a bit where the a fundamental question that I would invite you to uh, consider. And if you want, I can already, I can stop here, Marco, if we're approaching the end. Uh, yeah, we're, we're five, four minutes uh, to the end. Uh, if we can um, just get some questions, is there any question um, from the audience? Otherwise, I have one. Um, I will start then. Um, so it's a political game at the end of the day. Um, it's, you know, protectionism by any standard is not good for the economy and for economic growth. And this has been proven in the past. But how do you solve the political battle? I don't think it's a problem of you know the economy or leaving the market behave like the market is the problem of yeah, like essentially fr protect the market from the political decision, I guess. It's a twisted game. You know. Yes, um, and I don't think we will, in the sense that for a long time, my impression, also 
studying economics and growing up uh, still uh, in the remnants of a previous era, uh, economics has all been about fencing itself out from politics. And so as much as possible, uh, looking for the optimal solution, irrespective of geopolitical consideration, military consideration, national security considerations, and so on. Increasingly, it is becoming very hard to do economics without looking at uh, national security. I am told, I have not lived that era, and I suspect the people in this chat uh, or uh, seminar are too young to, to remember that era as well. I am told that when you were doing economics in the 70s, or during a Cold War type of setting, as well, economists had to work with uh, national security concerns and considerations and building them inside their models. Uh, whereas we have had the benefit up until now of, of sort of separating the two. Increasingly, I suspect we, we will not be able to separate the two and so that it is a bit wishful thinking to try and fence ourselves out of this. Um, we have another question from Rob. Um, I don't know if you want to read it. Do you want me to read it? Rob, do you want to? Uh, well, I have just quickly posed it. Thanks, Celestia. Great talk. I was I was interested in um, the, all the arguments around industrial policy, which seems to be mostly focused on supporting new industries of the future. If there is talk around policies uh, deliberately seeking decline of unsustainable industries. Yes, so in that paper I was uh, I was mentioning uh, that I wrote with uh, with a few colleagues uh, um, was published on science and public policy. We look exactly at this. So we try to say, look, there is a resurgence of industrial policy. Let's try to learn from the past and from experience that different countries have had throughout the world, given all uh, have engaged in industrial policy at different moments in time. What can we learn? Is there a good way of doing industrial policy and a bad way? And definitely there is a good and a bad way. And you're sort of hinting at one of the points we, we raise in our compendium of to-dos. Um, and it is uh, keep uh, the focus on the future to a certain extent. So remain focused on why you're doing it, uh, even if it's a national security concerns, it's a supply chain concerns or whatnot, but keep that in mind. And typically that means focusing on future industries and technologies, whereas often, again, for political economy reasons, you're at risk of identifying national champions, let's say, uh, with your firms that are big right now, but perhaps that represent a paradigm and production that is, uh, um, that is inevitably on the decline. And if you're planning to use industrial policy to lean against the wind of change, you're gonna lose. No matter how many billions you, you end up pledging, uh, you will not keep uh, horse carriages alive vis-a-vis -vis the car by simply uh, flushing the industry with money. So you, you must realize that trend and accompany the transition, but you cannot try to, to keep uh, old uh, industries uh, alive. Um, we're running out of time. I don't know if people and Alessia have still time. I've got like a bunch of questions here. Uh, Alessia, do you still have like five, 10 minutes to answer yeah. this one? Uh, those of you that want to stay and listen to the answer, otherwise, thank you so much for attending. I know we're running out of the uh, hour. Um, from Amy, uh, how do you see these factors dynamics may change when climate risk are high enough to justify strong uh, collective action? It's a very good. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, ex but I, I sort of. I don't want to say I disagree. I, I think it's an important question, but to a certain extent, I, I expect the direction of change to, to go in the opposite way. In the sense that as climate change will materialize, it will not materialize, you know, we, we frame it as uh, a global problem, which it is because the atmosphere is changing and that is uh, our global atmosphere. But in practice, climate change will materialize with localized shocks. And some countries will be hit earlier than others, and, uh, and this is due in part to geography, in part to income levels and, and therefore access to technologies to try and defend yourself as much as possible uh, from, uh, from the negative consequences of climate change and to adapt to climate change. Uh, as this happens, uh, because also uh, many of the countries that will be hit first and most are those that contributed the least to the problem, 
I suspect that tensions between uh, countries, uh, especially rich, richer countries and poorer countries, will increase. It will not decrease. And, and to a certain extent, we're already seeing that. So the last COP was already saved in the 11th hour, and there was a block, uh, let's say a, a north versus south uh, block. Um, and, uh, and I suspect that this is, uh, this is a bit the, the direction that we're moving in. Uh, which is unfortunate. Again, I'm not celebrating it, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not seeing the, the ultimate treaty solution or global government solution to climate change uh, uh, any time in the... Um, I'll take the last two. I'll try to combine it. Um, so I'll let everyone go. Um, so from Deccan, uh, so making this transition more expensive, is it taking us closer or further away from the green economy? the way we know it, or this is just like a geopolitical thing that we have economics with a green tag. Uh, how do you categorize and view the uh, effectiveness of defensive policy, such as like cardboard, uh, carbon border adjustment uh, and joint tariffs to discourage uh, unsustainable practices? I don't know if you want to try and combine the answer here for both. I know it's a lot to take. Um, I, I guess everyone here will probably talk for another half an hour and discuss like what's what's uh, what's what's out of Australia, and you know what's the take. Um. So the second question was on CBAM. The first one was on. Um. um like making these green. If we make these uh, the, green the fact that you're making expensive. the green transition more expensive. Yes. So that is a bit the battle of the Martins that I was telling you about before. Um, and it is part of the discussion we're having in Europe right now because, um, you know, it would be cheap. We, we constantly say that uh, the green transition is expensive or that it will require loads of investments in the hundreds of billions and whatnot. And then we take measures that effectively are increasing that price tag. But at the same time, you have, uh, um, you have an opposition to uh, a political opposition to the green transition that go, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but goes again along the lines of uh, the green transition is in the service of China and it will lead to the industrialization in Europe. And so we will lose jobs and we will end up driving only uh, Chinese cars, simplified for, for the sake of time. Um, and so I suspect that uh, you know, to a certain extent, if we are to retain political uh, approval of uh, the green transition, we need to make an economic success out of it. And, uh, and that, to a certain extent, will require some degree of this industrial policy. And so it might come with a higher price tag, but a price that is probably necessary uh, to pay. Again, this is suboptimal to the ideal uh, equilibrium. But I suspect the alternative equilibrium is even worse, uh, which is one where the politics becomes uh, super toxic and will just impede the green transition uh, altogether. And on CBAM uh, is uh, so the carbon border adjustment tax. Uh, uh, what can I say? I am uh, not because I work at the European Commission, but I've been uh, I've been writing uh, positively about it in the fact that it's an effort to try and spread the green transition. Uh, to other countries, to countries that are uh, less ambitious than uh, than the current European effort, uh, and that is the is the setting in which uh, it is being done, um, and we are seeing some signs of that. So we are seeing some countries that, because of CBAM, are starting to think through what can they do to try and reduce the carbon content of some of their industries. Uh, I'm told, including in uh, Southeast Asia, so countries like Vietnam or starting to look at ways to decarbonize uh, because of CBAM. A point that I did not make, but it's great that this question allows me to make, and it was at the end of the conversation of the presentation, was to say, look, through these measures, through these defensive and offensive uh, industrial policy tools, you are messing up emerging markets or less developed economies. And so, if on the one side you are doing that, you should take active measures to try and help them out. At the very least, the countries that you see as allies, close-minded, strategic, you name it, 
uh, but you should help them in the decarbonization process or help them to uh, to reduce the negative effects of this uh, of this of these tools that you're taking at home um because uh, because you want them to go hand in hand and because you want to keep the, let's say these alliances so even if you look at it from a geopolitical or international political economy uh perspective uh, and so yeah you should uh, you should help them out thank you so much alessio i think we can close here uh that was very very interesting super super amazing presentation uh thank you so much uh i know it's morning for you so probably you have the day ahead Long day ahead <laughs> well we're done here so most of <laughs> us probably go home after this well thank you so much to everyone that attended the session and thanks rob for setting this up um i don't know the, the, i'll see you at the next one i guess thank you marco thank, thank you much. alicia for a great talk thanks everyone for joining thank you good